you have joined the webinar from the Ioneer Foundation titled Sight and Sound Bites. And uh, we are going to get started right here. So thank you. And um, uh, welcome. The Sight and Sound Bites is a biweekly series of webinars that we do and we broadcast from the Ioneer Foundation. Uh, this uh, biweekly webinar series started in April 2020, 2020, and we highlight the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in the Departments of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology. Today's topic is understanding diabetic retinopathy, diagnosis, treatment, and future directions. I'm Lawton Snyder. I'm the CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck. And at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh, the funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research are made possible because of philanthropic support. And we use the philanthropic support that, that does, uh, comes into the Ioneer Foundation specifically to support research in these departments. Thank you for everybody who's been uh, supporting us with your philanthropic donations. To go over a few housekeeping roles for our webinar. Um, you're used to using Zoom, many of you, but um, the chat feature that you may be used to using uh, is disabled for this uh, webinar series. So what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to click on the Q&A function, which is down below, to ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions. We will hold questions, uh, reading your questions until the end, and I'll read the questions that people ask. Um, we'll ask you to refrain from uh, any personal health questions um, that may not be of interest to everybody that's listening. So um, if you do have a personal health question, what I encourage you to do is email it to uh, Mr. Craig Smith, who's on, um, uh, on your webinar information, and we'll send that to our clinical team. Um, you'll receive a survey tomorrow about uh, today's webinar. We'll like it. We appreciate your opinions. And then we also, uh, you'll be added to our mailing list or email list to receive information about future webinars. Um, my apologies regarding Dr. Sahel, he wasn't able to join us today, but um, uh, we uh, have our, our primary speakers. He usually, Dr. Sahel has been doing the introductions for these, but um, I'm gonna get a chance to introduce today's speakers and I'm delighted to do so. Um, today we have uh, our um, Dr. Andrew Eller, um, who is professor of ophthalmology uh, Retina and Vetris Services and Director of Ocular Trauma, and Dr. Colin Prensky, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, Retina and Vitreous Services. So, um, Dr. Uh, Eller and Dr. Prensky, welcome, and thank you for, for coming on and doing the uh, Ioneer Foundation webinar. Uh, you guys can unmute yourself, please. Thank okay, you. I'm here. I am on. <laughs> All right, good to see you both. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna do a different format. Some of our, our viewers who maybe joined us before are used to the fact that we kind of, uh, the, the, usually the speakers just kind of do a presentation. What we plan today is a, is a actual question and answer session first that, uh, that I'm gonna be uh, working with you on. And, and, um, and that, because this is, a very, uh, this is a very important topic and it's one that I think a lot of people will be interested in just hearing from experts like yourself on what the most important things are to know about diabetic retinopathy. So to start, you know, there are um, 34 million people in the United States that have diabetes. It's 10% of the U.S. population. Honestly, um, one in 10 people that we, that, you know, would, would have this. So everybody knows somebody with diabetes. You know. um, but it, it affects the eye. And tell us why we need to care so much about how diabetes affects the eye. You want me to take that one? Sure, you can start. Uh, let me, I'll put on a little. Okay. Here, who can give you a little bit of a visual aid here. So obviously, we, we care a lot about vision and diabetic retinopathy is the number one cause of significant vision loss, legal blindness in the under 65 age group, 
over 65, we worry more, more about macular degeneration, which is another topic completely, but under 65, it's the number one cause of blindness. And the thing that's really tragic about that is that in virtually every patient who goes blind from diabetes, it would have been preventable had they been picked up earlier and had treatment applied. So treatment works very well if you catch it early and doesn't work as well, just like any disease, if you catch it late. So that's why it's really important is that this is really basically a preventable cause of blindness if we can treat people. I'd also add that, you know, the, the history of our understanding of diabetic retinopathy is one at the heart of medical research in general. And so when we talk about screening and treatment and management of patients with diabetes, uh, our, we're guided by literally decades of some of the most fundamentally uh, well thought out research that exists in any area of medicine. Uh, and so we're privileged to have really science behind what we do. We're in, a, we're in frankly, a lot of medicine. We don't necessarily always have the best evidence of guiding what we're doing. Uh, with diabetes, we really have a lot of evidence. And so it, it, it speaks a lot to what Dr. Eller just mentioned about how so much of the toll on communities as well as individual patients uh, is preventable. It's so we can prevent the, you know, the damage, but where does the damage occur with we can patients go back to who have this. diabetic sure. retinopathy? So, so when we're complete. diabetic retinopathy, so retina is in the name. Uh, so it's a, it's a disease that uh, diabetes can affect other parts of the eye, but primarily what we're concerned about is the retina, which lines the back wall of the eye, much like uh, wallpaper. And if you think about, if you look at this diagram, you can see that the eye is organized pretty much the same way as a camera, uh, where you have the, the lens apparatus at the front of the eye, uh, composed of the cornea and a pupil, which is an aperture within the iris, and then you have your lens. And in the back of the eye, you have the retina, which functions as the film in the camera. And uh, so I, I can let Dr. Eller expand on it a little bit more, but uh, I just wanted to have a few pictures so that we can orient ourselves. So so if you look at this picture here, this is the optic nerve. So the eye is basically like a digital camera and a digital camera, after you take a picture, you plug it into your computer, the computer then develops the picture and you can, you can modify it on your computer. The eye is the camera, your brain is the computer and the nerve is the cord that connects the eye to the brain. And then you can see coming out of the nerve these elaborate blood vessels. We have arteries and we have veins. So the arteries bring the blood into the eye and the veins take it out. Well, one of the problems we know about diabetes, it affects circulation. And we know that patients can get foot ulcers and, and different problems uh, with their extremities due to poor circulation. And that kind of makes sense. If the heart's our main pump of blood, the legs and the feet are very far from the heart. So you can kind of get an idea that those pipes, if you think of an artery as a pipe, is pretty far away from the heart. But the eye is pretty close to the heart. So why would the eye get involved? And the answer is vision takes a lot of energy. You can think about it this way. We can run a radio on a couple batteries, but TV takes a lot of energy. You have to plug that into the wall. So the retina actually uses more energy pound per pound than any organ in the body, more than the heart, more than the brain, more than the liver. And so these blood vessels are very active in bringing nutrition to the retina so we can have vision. And when they're disturbed by diabetes, and we don't really understand what it is about blood sugars being too high and having diabetes actually does to make the blood vessels um, malfunction or not work, we're not sure why that happens, but we do know that it does happen. And when the retina doesn't get the nutrition it needs, then it behaves badly. And then we call that a retinopathy. 
Colin, would you add anything to that? Sure. Well, we can. Uh, so this is the normal picture. So we can categorize diabetic retinopathy in a couple of different ways, depending on how it affects it. But this is a picture of uh, what, what's referred to as non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which basically means that the blood vessels have started to malfunction. And what you can see are areas where the blood vessels are leaking, causing little areas of hemorrhage, as well as little areas of, uh, of lipid almost uh, deposits that are, exist in the normal serum of our blood that uh, leak out into the retina, uh, as well as areas where the what are called cotton wool spots, which are little focal areas where the blood flow is actually blocked. And so the nerve fiber layer of the retina uh, sort of swells up and becomes white. Uh, and but what has not yet happened are the growth of abnormal new vessels, which uh, is what distinguishes this from proliferative disease. Uh, this is a, a person who may walk into the, to the office and actually not have any symptoms at this point, uh, because in spite of the fact that they have damage that's visible, it's not yet affecting uh, their ability to see quite well. And that's another reason why it's very important to stress this to patients that we don't want to wait until people have started losing vision. Um, and, and so I can expand a little bit on that by uh, showing this would be an example of what can happen when somebody does begin to lose vision, where the, the center of the retina actually becomes swollen, because as those blood vessels become dysfunctional, they leak. So the, the, the pipes or the hoses function almost like a, a drip irrigation in your garden. They're no longer sealed. The fluid leaks out and puffs up the, uh, the tissue of the retina itself. So now it doesn't, you can't see as well in this case. And Colin, then, can, you go, can you go back one slide? To this one, sure. Yeah, this one. Um, so one of the things I want to point out, because people will come into the emergency room, say, I just lost my vision. From and we say it's from diabetes, and they say, well, you can fix it, I just lost it yesterday. And what I wanna point out here is that the retina is kind of like a target, and all of our vision is right here, right in the center area. Going and back to this, within the macula, yeah, and specifically. Right here is the center of the target. So if you think of a target where you throw darts, you wanna hit the center because that's the bullseye, that's 100 points. And outside the bullseye, we have less and less points. So if you look at this patient here with all this diabetic change in the retina, the very center is perfect. This person has 20-20 vision. They walk around thinking they are terrific. There's I nothing will confirm with you that the patient does in fact have 20-20 vision. This is a, a patient with 20-20 vision. Wow. And so, you know, they're but they're just, if you think of these leaks, you know, coming from the damaged vessels, these leaks here just have to go just a couple, maybe a millimeter before it affects the vision. And so, so this really shows us why screening ahead of time, and we tell our diabetic patients, you have to come in at least on an annual basis so we can take a look. Because if we saw this patient in the office, we'd recommend treatment because we don't want to lose vision. We want to maintain vision. So people, we know people with diabetes, you know, the, the, the risk factors that with the diabetes um, is related to or things like cardiovascular disease and, and kidney uh, disease and other things that, and, and those are usually related to vascular issues. So diabetes actually is hard on our vessels. So is that, that's essentially what you're telling us here is that it's also hard on the vessels in the eye and yep. that's the damage we're seeing? Just absolutely. What I always explain to patients too, because what, what can often happen um, People have diabetes, they, their primary care doctor will badger them into getting their eyes checked, which is the right thing to do. That's the recommendation. But often patients will come for years for their eye exam and not really understand what we're doing, what we're looking for. And so I, I think it's very important to explain that there's sort of two purposes to the eye exam. One is we want to preserve vision. Obviously, Dr. Eller and myself and all of our colleagues, we have a vested interest in people being able to see. That's what we've dedicated our lives to. It's what patients care about. Um, there's, a there's also a second part of this, which is that the blood vessels in the eye are special because they help us see, but they're also special because we can just see them. You can't see the blood vessels in the kidney. You can't see the blood vessels in the hands, in the feet that help with the nerves that 
can lead to the problems people have with numbness and wound healing. You can't see into the heart. Um, we have a very powerful tool that's 100 years old, which is just a special microscope that allows us to look into the back of the eye and see the blood vessels as they're living. And so by us looking at how the, the health of the retina appears to us, it can also tell the primary care doctor and the endocrinologist and the nephrologist a lot of information about the health of the person in general, because it's the one part of the body that we can actually just look and see. So, so when the doctor says that, you know, you, you know, you've got diabetes, you need to uh, exercise and watch your nutrition and, and, uh, and, and, and take, and take care of yourself. And you need to see an eye doctor. How, uh, you know, that, so, so that it's said in the office, but how often do they actually uh, do it? Is it a, is, is there, um, what would, why would people not come in and see their eye doctor if they're told, again, that's something they need to do? Well, there's a number of reasons, Lonnie, why people don't come in. One is they don't want to get dilated. They don't want a dilated eye exam because they can't maybe drive home safely or they have to bother a friend to come with them. And maybe it's because they have this false sense of security that I, my vision's 2020. How bad can my retina be? As we just discussed, that's very false because there could be problems there. Another reason people don't come in is that they may have a lot of other medical issues that they're contending with. And you only have so much time in the day to go to so many doctors. As a diabetic, you may be going to the dentist, the podiatrist, the heart doctor, the endocrinologist, your kidney doctor. You can have a whole black book full of doctor's names. And uh, one of my patients once said to me, when I was a young man, I had a black book for, full of girls' names. He said, now I have a black book full of doctor's names. <laughs> and so you, you say, well, in 2020, that's the least of my concerns. I'll keep going to my other doctors. And one of the things we've done at UPMC Eye Center, if we've set up cameras in many of our offices that give us a picture just like the one you're seeing on your screen, it does not require dilation. So it gives us a lot of information without having to come in and get dilated. So or even making it easier for people. So if someone's been diagnosed and uh, with diabetes, I should say, that, that how, how soon should they come in and how often that should they come in to see an eye doctor? Well, generally speaking, when people are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, uh, on average, they've actually been suffering from diabetes for years before it was diagnosed. So somebody who is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as an, an adult should be seen basically right away. Um, obviously, it's not a same-day emergency, but it's something that should be done fairly expediently. It's as soon as possible. Yeah, as soon as possible. When, when children are diagnosed at a young age with type 1 diabetes, it's a little different because, generally speaking, people don't develop diabetic retinopathy for several years. Um, but for the most part, what we see are generally people with type 2 diabetes. That's the most common, at least in, in my experience here. And so in general, it's, we'll see people who, they're, <laughs> they come in and they were diagnosed last week. And that's, that's appropriate. If, if their eyes are still healthy, we have guidelines that, that have been well, well established for decades that say that, you know, the, up to a point, annual screening is, is acceptable. Uh, but if once we start seeing evidence of uh, retinopathy, oh, sorry, like the image that we're seeing, you know, then, then things change. Either, either you have to monitor more often um, or, or begin treating. Well, so, so obviously um, when you're diagnosed, you should get in right away or as soon as you can. And then, um, and then you're followed every year. Is that right? Every or, year if the eyes are looking, I mean, if, the, if somebody has no retinopathy at all, they're still seen once a year. Okay. Um, you know, the, if, if we see more advanced disease, sometimes we have to see them every 
three or four months, every six months. And then there are cases right. where we're treating people and so we're seeing them once a month or, or you know, or so. Lonnie, if, if someone has type one, the juvenile type, because it takes a while for retinopathy to develop, that we don't see them for about five or six years after they've been diagnosed. The problem with the type two is that normally a, blood, a fasting blood sugar, a normal fasting blood sugar is below 126. And people can have a blood sugar of 150, 170 and feel very good. And so they can have that for years before they happen to go to the doctor and get tested and say, oh, you have diabetes, we need to treat you. And so those patients come in or diagnosed and say, I was just diagnosed with diabetes. And we say, yes, but your eye looks like this. Mm. And, and that's one of the problems with uh, type two diabetes is that you have to go to the doctor every year for your annual physical so they can check you and make sure you don't have it. We'll also have patients who will go to their optometrist just to get a new pair of glasses because they just don't feel like they're seeing as well. And they may walk in like this, and we are the ones who make the diagnosis of diabetes. I mean, that's the power of the eye exam. You, and you're it, the ones who tell them, I think yeah. you've got diabetes. And it's why in many cases, you know, it's a reasonable argument that a, a, a real eye exam is, is an important thing, even for people who don't know, um, you know, that they don't, they don't know that they have diabetes, just your average person on the street, if they walk in to get their, get a new pair of glasses, it's not an unreasonable thing to actually have a real eye exam as opposed to just a, uh, an electronic auto refractor and a pair of glasses, you know, and walk out. We can learn a lot about people based on their eye exam. So you said that someone would notice changes in their vision to a person who's, who's experiencing or, you know, it has diabetic retinopathy or maybe doesn't know it. What are the changes in vision that actually would be occurring? How would, what would, what would they lose in their visual field? So, so diabetes affects the eye really in two different ways. Colin showed this picture, which shows here's the normal retina up here. You can see there's multiple layers. The retina is like a stack of papers. There's 10 pieces of paper that create this retina. And in this picture, because the blood vessels in the macula in the center are leaky, it's like a garden hose with pinholes in it, it's leaky, the retina swells and these are pockets of fluid from the, it's not blood, but it's the water in our blood that leaks out and the retina swells and that will give someone blurred vision. So if you think about it this way, if this is water in the retina, it's kind of like looking through your car windshield without the wipers on in the rain. Okay. You can see, but not very well. And it may also be distortion. So not just blurry vision, you know, but distortion. Um, straight lines looking not straight, looking wobbly, or the size of objects from one eye to the other looking unusual. People will describe funhouse mirror effects when they have a lot of swelling in the center because it's not, it's not just swollen evenly all over. You may have one area that's uh, thicker than another. And, so that's another unusual kind of experience for somebody who may just develop symptoms suddenly. So is every, everybody with, who has diabetes, of course, is at risk for diabetic retinopathy, but not everybody that comes in to see you who has diabetes actually has, comes, you know, shows the, 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 the changes in the eye and, and the loss of vision. Um, what's the difference there? You know, are there, um, risk factors in addition to diabetes that make you a greater risk of developing diabetic retinopathy? The two greatest risks for diabetic retinopathy are how long you've had it. The longer you have diabetes, the greater the risk. And how well your diabetes is controlled. So there's a test called the hemoglobin A1C test. That gives us an average of your control over a three-month period. And normally we like your test to be around 7% or seven. People that have higher levels, eight, nine, 10, 11%, they're a much higher risk for retinopathy. The other, the other factors that can also worsen the disease are the control of blood pressure. So if you think of 
diabetes is weakening the pipes that's carrying the, the blood, the pressure in the blood obviously um, puts more stress on those already weakened vessels. So that, that conceptually makes sense to people usually when you tell them that. So uh, the blood pressure as well as their cholesterol, which high cholesterol we also know affects blood vessels. So anything- When you look at this picture, these are actually cholesterol particles in the retina. The, the white flecks. These white dots. Oh, wow. And so, then you were asking about what else can happen. So I did, ex you know, we, we explained that right now the main issue for this patient is the swelling. Um, but you can also have a disease that where abnormal new blood vessels grow, uh, which pull on the retina uh, as they grow and, and stick to the retina and contract. And so ultimately leading to very, very severe problems, very complicated retinal detachments in its most advanced form, which is we're seeing a fairly advanced form of that, but also bleeding because these abnormal blood vessels that grow are quite fragile and they, they can bleed and the eye can suddenly fill with blood. And so somebody might be seeing 20, 20 one day and then wake up and not be able to see more than a hand moving in front of their face because they have blood in, in filling the eye. Obviously you can't take a photograph of the retina in that state, but um, this is just an example of a patient who, who had what's called proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The abnormal blood vessels are proliferating. And in this sort of four month period, you can see just in that period of time, how these, uh, the retina starts to kind of get pulled out of position, which uh, is not a good thing. It's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want something Obviously, like this. Obviously you have even greater vision loss. That's happening, I imagine. Yeah. Right, let me expand upon that for a second. If you think of again, as that eyeball, the first diagram, the, the eyeball itself. And we said that most of our vision is in the back at the, at the bullseye. The retina on the side really doesn't do a lot for us. It's a little extra retina. It's a little bit of side vision, some night vision, but it's really not critical retina. And so the eye is very smart. It said, if, if my blood vessels are getting damaged and I only have so much blood flow to bring to the eye, I'm going to send the blood flow to the center where all the vision is. And I'm going to ignore that retina on the side. But the retina on the side says, hey, I'm hungry. I'm lacking nutrition and I have to do something about it. So the retina says, aha, I'm very smart. If the blood vessels I have aren't working, I'll grow new ones. And that's what we call proliferation. It's a proliferation of new blood vessels. The problem is the eye has a good idea but doesn't do it right. Instead of growing the blood vessels back into the retina where we want them, it grows them on the surface of the retina. And the inside of that eyeball is full of a gel called vitreous, which is like an egg white, and it grows into the egg white. And then the egg white, you see the vitreous humor, here is all egg white. And the blood vessels grow into it. And when they grow into the jelly, the jelly can wiggle a little bit, break the blood vessels, and then the middle of the eye starts to fill up with blood. And people will come in saying, I see cobwebs in my vision, but they're not just cobwebs. It's almost like a lava lamp. I see uh, these big clots floating around. It will sometimes look like a reddish black cigarette smoke filling up the eye. It's very frightening when it happens. And you can have 20-20 vision, again, because the macula is perfect until that happens. And that's the kind of thing, that, again, that we would want to detect on a routine eye exam before you start having bleeding. So if, if someone has, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Eller, you know, that the, uh, um, the control for diabetes and the measures for control like the uh, hemoglobin um, A1C and so forth. So if, if they're looking at, if they, uh, if, you, if you have diabetes, but you control it really well, you do all the things you're supposed to do, you're following your diet and, and keeping it under control and, and your, your blood work comes back that you're controlling it. Will you still be at risk for developing this or can you prevent it completely by taking care of your diabetes? Again, the longer you have diabetes, the higher the risk. But we, we grade diabetes when we look at a patient in the office as no diabetes, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, and then proliferative. So um, first I have to do a shout out to my mother 
Hi, mom. <laughs> and, and my younger brother was diagnosed it with diabetes when he was 14. And I get his eye reports because he goes every year. And he does have retinopathy and he's had it for years. But he is still kind of in that mild phase, mild, moderate phase, even though he's been diabetic for very close to um, 50 years. Wow. So it's not, so he's being followed, but he's not at a vision threatening you know, level where we're worried about blindness. And because he's being followed yearly, if his progression continues, then he would be a candidate for treatment. And my brother should never go blind. Well, that's that encouraging. Mom, he'll never go blind. Okay. Yeah, that's encouraging. So tell us about what you can do when someone actually starts to show these uh, clinical signs that we're seeing here. What are the treatment options? How can you manage this? Well, the scientists have really helped us a lot in the last 15 years. Remember we said there's two types of retinopathy, one leaky blood vessels, and that's in the macula where the retina swells, and the other is the growth of abnormal blood vessels. Both problems are started by a chemical that's called a growth factor in the eye. So for example, when the retina doesn't have good circulation and it says, I want more circulation, it produces a growth factor, a special chemical that says grow blood vessels. So now we have a drug. It took this, this chemical, this growth factor was I theorized back in the thirties that, it, that it, it was around, but they couldn't find it until probably 20 years ago. And that, that really, uh, made a huge, huge advance in how we treat eye disease. Because as soon as they are able to identify this chemical factor, they were able to build a drug that blocks it. And by giving a person this drug, it, it shrinks these blood vessels. And at the same time, because the leaks that occur in the macular edema, the swelling, is generated by increased permeability of the vessels, the same growth factor also is a permeability factor. So it doesn't just grow abnormal vessels, but it actually makes vessels leak. So we can use, it, use this growth factor in both cases to control the disease. Prior to that, we use laser treatment, which was also very effective. Well, Colin, you I, want to talk about the growth factor a little more? Well, <laughs> actually, you know, um, and uh, I, I want to know about um, research. Are there things that are going on that we um, can see possibly, you know, making treatments better or improving, you know, or, or maybe helping restore vision for people who have lost it. Yeah, I had alluded earlier to the long history of research in terms of diabetic retinopathy. So in, in many ways, everything from, so going back to the 70s and 80s using laser, that was guided by very, very, very important studies. You can look at them as the foundation of evidence-based medicine in general, the diabetic retinopathy study and the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study that were done in, out of, centered out of Wisconsin. Um, more recently with the advent of these anti-vascular endothelial growth factor medications or anti-VEGF drugs, you'll see that's what they are referred to. The, we have begun treating things differently. And originally, you know, in the early days of anti-VEGF, which is not that long ago, 14, 15 years ago, we predominantly used them to treat the swelling in the center because laser is, does cause some destruction. And so we wanted to avoid using laser in the center as much as possible. And over time, we realized how effective it was at treating the proliferative disease in the peripheral retina as well. So there is a large network called the drcr.net network of uh, many institutions across the country that's contributing to uh, expanding our understanding of how best to treat diabetic retinopathy primarily, but now other things as well. And we, have, we are a, a part of that drcr.net uh, as of fairly recently, actually, we've, we've joined the, the company of very elite institutions that are participating in this. 
And so every year at our national meeting, we have new, new evidence to support the use of these medications. Um, obviously, a big thrust that has been sped up by the COVID phenomenon, for lack of a better term, is the push into telemedicine. And diabetic retinopathy has been a very fertile test bed for telescreening for years in ophthalmology. We have uh, screening cameras in primary care offices all around the community. But in the last few years, machine learning and artificial intelligence has opened the windows to new ways of improving our ability to provide screening to people who have barriers of care. So that's something that obviously uh, we are very interested in trying to expand our, our, our footprint in terms of the screening and uh, telemedicine capabilities. Uh, and more broadly, in the eye center, regenerative medicine and uh, restoration of vision is a huge focus broadly. Now, we're, a lot of those areas are not necessarily focusing specifically at diabetes per se, but hopefully with advances that will show us better understanding of how we can restore vision, uh, the applications could potentially be almost limitless. So I, I'm going to... Uh, um, I'm going to jump in one second, Lonnie. Sure. So one of the things that we're kind of skirting around is with these the medications that we use for this, they have to be injected into the eye, which sounds very scary. It is kind of a frightening thought that someone's gonna put a needle into my eye, and yet it's something that Dr. Prinsky and I do dozens of times in a day, because we have so many patients that are treated this way. But the drug does not work as an eye drop. It doesn't work as a pill. It could be given IV, but there's way too many side effects. So we numb the eye up with Novocaine and we do the injections. And frankly, as frightening as it sounds, it's absolutely painless. The worst part of it is that we do worry about infections. We use some antiseptic eye drops, which can sting, but it's done painlessly. But it has to be done fairly often. Some patients can get away, get away with every three months, but depending on the level of retinopathy, while other patients are getting injections in both eyes on a monthly basis. So one of the we're not going to change that with the injections. But what we can change with the injections is finding a different method for what we'll call drug delivery. And that's where we are excelling at Ioneer because we have in our department a chemical engineer who's working on different ways to modify drugs to turn them into a gel that you might inject a gel into the eye that would last longer and maybe you know, have an effect for six months. So all of a sudden we might see in the future going from an injection monthly to one or two injections a year. And, and that's going to be a big advance. I mean, this is not a trivial, a trivial fact either, because beyond the, the, just the superficial idea of, well, who wants to get more injections than they need to? I mean, that's obvious, but most patients with diabetic retinopathy that needs treatment, that needs to be treated, have... I forget off the top of my head, but they, the average number of doctor visits a month is pretty staggering. So the, the burden on, that, on those patients, we might think of ourselves, oh, I'm, I'm the eye doctor and I see them once a month and that's all I care about. But the fact is that those patients, their lives are so disrupted by the fact that they're seeing a podiatrist and they're seeing an endocrinologist and their primary care doctor and maybe a cardiologist uh, maybe a nephrologist, they might be on dialysis. So any, any way that we can improve our ability to keep people out of our office living their lives is a huge benefit, not just to, to their vision, but their productivity for their family, their support people that have to bring them in and out. I mean, it's, it's the butterfly effect of this is, is tremendous. Um, to me, that's the biggest downside of our, of our treatments, which are nothing short of miraculous compared to what we had before these injections. But there is the downside, which is it's very inconvenient for people and beyond inconvenient. I mean, it's, it takes over their life. Well, 
this is this has been extremely interesting. Now, um, I, I as we're talking about research, um, I do see that Dr. Sal was able to join us on the panel, and uh, Dr. Sal, I, I might ask you to, you know, come in on the conversation regarding any other things going on in the department that would relate to this. Um, and, and then I want to open up questions for our, our viewers. Um, but uh, please, Dr. Sal, you know, uh, if there's, uh, I know these are topics we, that we hit on with you quite often, so. Um. Well, uh, thank you, Loni. Uh, first of all, I think uh, Dr. Eller and uh, Dr. Prensky described quite well uh, the amount of research that's going on. Uh, I think we should view that as a continuum. Uh, many, many years ago, Jake Waxman and others in the department uh, understood clearly that the screening for early stages is probably one of the most important features. So we have now that many cameras all across the system that we the plan has implemented and actually the foundation has also helped to deploy in the, for underserved populations. So this is a very important aspect. The prevention is uh, probably the most important aspect in diabetic retinopathy. And I think they, they couldn't emphasize that enough and they did a lot uh, today to explain about that. Then in terms of research, we are dealing both with the vascular disease and inflammatory disease and the neuronal disease. And in the department, as you know, we now have a, a large panel of scientists. We have people working on high resolution imaging that are able to see the cells in the retina and to monitor. And we have a Dr. Rossi that is really enabling us to see the damage, especially to the uh, inner part of the retina, the ganglion cells that we, we can monitor. Uh, we have people working on regenerating the retina and uh, some stages of the disease, this might be the only option, but this is certainly a long, long-term goal, not something for the short term. Uh, the optic nerve gets some damage also in the disease, and uh, this, as you know, this is an important area of research in the department. Interestingly, we have also a lot of collaborations with other teams because we don't work in a silo, the Department of Ophthalmology. There are people that are working on the metabolic aspect of the disease and people that are working on the vascular aspect of the disease. And currently, there is an ongoing collaboration that also actually in includes scientists in Paris that are part of this three-part uh, research on uh, the vascular component of diabetic retinopathy. But uh, clearly, uh, many of the approaches that we are developing for regener regenerating vision may apply to diabetic retinopathy at some point. But the main thing is to avoid the need to, to resort to vision restoration strategies. But as was pointed out very clearly by, uh, by Andy and, uh, and Colin, these are preventable diseases. These are conditions like glaucoma. If properly managed, proper management saves a lot of problems. And this is what we need to do. To do. And uh, we have had a lot of progress with the injections. Now a lot of progress is being made in trying to reduce the number of injections. Hopefully this will happen. We were very hopeful that a new drug would enable us to reduce that. Unfortunately, this drug has some side effects, so it's not yet available, but hopefully another drug or that one will be made available for patients. So there is a lot of hope, but the, the key message was given today. You, you can avoid a lot of that if you, if you really follow properly your disease, and it's a lot for the patient, I agree, but it's much better than having to cope with uh, end-stage complications. Thank you. I, um, I'm going to ask our audience to go ahead and, and please put in your questions because we've done most of the talking here, but I, this is for myself even uh, as I hear, you know, um, obviously a lot of the work that goes on here on a regular basis. I've learned a lot today. So as you're, um, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you can click on Q&A, you can type questions. I have already a few from the audience. We'll am I, am I still sharing my screen? I tried to pause it so that you can... Maybe uh, you are still comfort. sharing your screen, so you can stop. Uh, okay, you know. I, I wanted to try to make it so that you could see Dr. Eller better. My, you okay, know. go ahead and, and stop sharing. There you go. Okay. All right, I thought I... Okay, great. So um, the first question, and I maybe we answered this as we were discussing, but is there a direct correlation between A1C and retinopathy, i.e. is a level of 7.5, for example, the trigger of, a, of for retinal damage? There's a lot of factors that go into how, how people get retinopathy that we don't understand. I've seen people with higher levels of A1C than anyone would like and have no retinopathy. And I tell them, don't take it for granted. It can take years for retinopathy to develop. So if you have a high level, let's get back on track. But, it, but it's not 
just because you have a high level doesn't necessarily mean you'll have retinopathy, but you're certainly at higher risk, if that answers the question. I think of diabetes almost as much as a social disease or a social problem as it is a medical problem. Social problem in the sense that it's more than just throwing medicine at it. It requires lifestyle adaptations that many of us don't want to live like a monk, where we go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time and eat our meals on schedule and so on. But diabetes craves a schedule. It craves getting enough sleep, enough exercise, and eating the right, right foods, as well as taking your medication. And if we keep all of those in balance, we should all live a long time and, and basically a normal life. It's just hard to, it's hard to maintain that. With good vision, hope. It, right, you know, and we understand that. Yeah. I mean, so, there, are, there are some things that are puzzling, at least to me personally, about this. And, you know, like what Dr. Eller said, why is it that sometimes we'll see people with an A1C of 13 or 14 that come in with no retinopathy? Similarly, like we talked about, you know, the blood vessels all throughout the body are exposed to this high, high sugar and exposed to the ravages of diabetes. You'd think that it would ha affect people the same way, but we're not machines. And so therefore, things don't always happen the same. There are people who are on dialysis because their kidneys have absolutely stopped working, whose, eye, whose retinas look practically normal. And why that should be the case, I, you know, it's, that's a mystery too for, for people who, who study the connection between diabetic nephropathy and diabetic retinopathy. So an, another question here, and I'll kind of expand on it. It says, you know, uh, can I have, um, uh, should I have a, a diabetic eye exam when I'm first diagnosed with diabetes? And I think we explained that, that, that we should. Does that exam need to be done by an ophthalmologist or, or do optometrists do that exam? What's involved in the diabetic eye exam? A well-trained optometrist should be able to do a good eye exam. Um, you know, particularly the younger optometrists coming out of school today, they're pretty well trained. The and, most and important thing is to get it scheduled and get in and, there, and get that. We done. also, as was sort of mentioned before too, in we more and more there are screening cameras in primary care offices where photos are taken and graded by uh, ophthalmologists within our department. So we may see a photograph that looks absolutely normal and so that, that means, okay, we'll just repeat that back in a year. Or we may see something that, su that suggests, well, you better come in and be seen by, a, by an ophthalmologist. Or we may say, well, the photograph just wasn't good enough because in some people they just don't get good photos. So uh, an ophthalmologist is probably always gonna say you should be seen in person, but there are, there are reasons for some people where that's just not practical or, or realistic. And so that's why telescreening is also important. And so these, these cameras that are out in the community do a good job to fill the gap. So um, <laughs> somebody's teasing you, Dr. Eller. Someone said that they, they think you may need a haircut soon. <laughs> well, <laughs> Who's your mother? <laughs> no, my mother. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Uh, it, it actually was your mother. <laughs> so, um, well, so uh, one more question that I have, and, and I think it also relates to what you're talking about with the telemedicine and, and everything else. Is it particularly more prevalent or more difficult for people um, who um, maybe have barriers to getting in to see our, our physicians or, uh, for one reason or other, maybe um, where they live, socioeconomic barriers, but also maybe uh, where they live if they're in a really rural area. And, and if, if it's more difficult for people to see in, do we see higher rates of diabetic retinopathy in areas where you would expect that those barriers might exist? I think that, I think that makes sense. Um, I don't yeah. have... I don't have the data in front of me, but you know that would be a pretty obvious conclusion. I mean, it's a, it's not only a problem here and and in our community. I mean, it's a, it's an emerging problem in the developing world as well because as uh, as diets change, become more Western, become more Americanized, you, you see huge rates of diabetic retinopathy that's very advanced, even in, 
in parts of the world where you'd think, how do these people have type two diabetes? Um, and unfortunately in those developing parts of the world where they don't have access to care, it becomes a tremendous actually impediment to development because it's such a burden on the communities as a whole to have people going blind from diabetes. Well, you know, um, it is something, of course, we're interested in here at the foundation, and we, we do uh, actually, um, I, we, a little bit of a leading question, actually, I, I know that Dr. Waxman, and he's going to be doing a, a program here in a few weeks, has collected some of the data. And it certainly is, uh, we, we do know that, um, that we see where, where barriers to healthcare are greater. Unfortunately, diabetic retinopathy um, is, is worse. And and so uh, it's interesting, these telemedicine and these other, you know, uh, tools will play an important role, as I understand, in making, um, you know, healthcare more accessible, and particularly as it relates to screening for problems like this, but also in just um, in, uh, in, in helping us understand more about the problem so we can address the problems related to the barriers as well. So uh, that, that's certainly something we, we want to address through the Ioneer Foundation um, and, and we are. So I, I don't see any additional questions, even from, uh, um, from uh, Dr. Eller's mother, <laughs> but I, I think uh, we'll give them a few seconds here. Anything else, folks, that you, anything else uh, from the panelists that you'd like to add um, before, we, uh, before we sign off? Guys, all right. We appreciate the support of the foundation as always very, very fortunate. Uh, how many ophthalmology departments in the country have a foundation that is able to support our research and our, our clinical efforts? And um, we're very grateful for all, all of that support. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sal, I see you come back on. Anything else to add? I'm here, but I just wanted to let the platin I just echo what uh, Dr. Eller said. We are very grateful to the donors and the foundation to support our efforts. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for everybody that stayed on. We had a, a, a nice group today, a nice uh, group of attendees, and, uh, and they've stayed with us for, for this amount of time. But um, as I don't see any more questions, uh, oh, sorry, just got one. Oh, just thanks to the webinar. Very informative. And thank you. Thank you for coming. Have a great rest of this beautiful day here in Pittsburgh. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.